Welcome everyone. Welcome um, to another Back to Basics talks, another preview to one of the upcoming CPPCon talks. So today's topic is exceptions. So I have one additional slide to introduce myself. Now, uh, Lucas, I've said most of the things that I wanted to say anyway. So my name is Klaus Edelberger, and it's perfectly okay if you stick to Klaus. So if you stick to the first name, I'm doing C++ trainings since approximately 2016, beginners trainings, advanced trainings, uh, all kinds of trainings. Apparently this is not enough C++ for me. I'm also doing C++ in my free time. For instance, I'm the author of a C++ math library called Blaze, and I'm one of the four organizers uh, of this user group. So today's topic, as I said before, is exceptions. And you might wonder why another talk about exceptions, because there is indeed a lot of talks going on that talk about this particular topic. As the title suggests, this talk is not an, um, a particularly deep uh, talk. It's a beginner-friendly talk. Uh, the CPPCon, uh, since last year, has an special track called Back to Basics, which is supposed to provide valuable information to um, non-experts in C++. So what we'll do today is, first of all, we'll talk about the exception situation. Then we'll talk a little bit about how exceptions work, the most important details about exceptions. And then we go into best practices of exception handling. So we'll talk of, uh, about when to use exceptions and when not, how to use exceptions properly. I'll talk about the exception safety guarantees and how to write code that can properly deal with exceptions. Um, I also have a couple of slides about refactoring, yeah, how to refactor to the things that we actually want to have. As I briefly mentioned, this is a preview of my CPPCon talk that will happen next Friday. Yeah, so not this week, but the week after on Friday. Um, this is the very first time I give this talk, which means there may be still rough edges. Everyone who finds things that are imperfect, yeah, um, typos, uh, missing braces, missing semicolons, whatever, send me an email or um, tell me in the, in the after talk chat, everybody who finds an imperfection gets a free ticket for our next meetup. Yeah, so this is, I believe, a very, very good opportunity. So keep your eyes open in order to find things that can be improved. Okay, I, I definitely appreciate any kind of help. All right, let's get started. Let's talk about the exception situation. And as I said before, uh, you might wonder why there is so many talks about exceptions. So just last year, CPPCon 2019, Ben Sachs gave a talk about exactly the same topic. So in the Back to Basics track, he talked about exception handling and exception safety. This year, there is another talk about exceptions. Why is that? Why are so many people talking about exceptions nowadays? I believe one of the primary reasons is a paper that has been um, written by Herb Sutter a couple of um, months ago, or a year ago approximately, uh, the document P0709. This document is proposing a complete overhaul of the current exception mechanism. And when I say complete overhaul, this truly means that exceptions might change significantly. And they should change for some very good reasons. So if you scroll down, then we actually realize that there is a couple of pretty interesting uh, uh, remarks here. Major, code, major coding guidelines ban exceptions, including common modern guidelines endorsed by the world's top advocates of C++ exceptions. For example, the Google C++ style guide bans exceptions. The Joint Strike Fighter Air Vehicle C++ Coding Standards, or short JSF++, was produced by a group that included Björn Strustrup and is published on Strustrup's personal webpage and bans exceptions. Many projects ban exceptions. In this particular survey, 52% of C++ developers re reported that exceptions were banned in part of all of their project code i.e. most are not allowed to freely use C++'s primary recommended error handling model that is required to use the C++ standard library, uh, language and library. So the conclusion of this is that this is an, in, an intolerable rift. Large numbers of C++ projects are not actually using standard C++. I totally agree that this is a problem. This is a problem uh, if, if 50% or even more percent of people, and I believe this number actually went up in the 2019 um, survey, uh, cannot use exceptions at all. And this, although 
exceptions are actually rated a reasonable way to um, deal with um, with errors. So in a talk given by Phil Nash and Simon Brand in CPCon 2018, they talked about all kinds of ways to report errors and propagate errors. They also, of course, talked about exceptions. And they rated exceptions on these eight um, um, speci- uh, specific parts. If you take just a look at the colors, green means good, then you see actually a lot of points are green. There's only one that is particularly bad, but in total, it looks quite reasonable. And still, exceptions are not particularly uh, why is that? What is the problem? Why do 52% of developers not use it or cannot use it? The first reason that definitely should be mentioned is that exceptions do incur an extreme performance overhead in the failure case. So in case that no exception is thrown, we usually uh, consider um, everything as no overhead. But in case you do throw an exception, the overhead is truly significant. And now borrowing a slide from um, Niall Douglas from one of these 2017 talks, Introduction to Proposed to Expected, where he presented a performance benchmark of, well, returning by value, returning by other things, and throwing exceptions. It is just the significance of the uh, of the size of this bar. Note that the y-axis is um, in, in logarithmic scale. So every line is a factor of 10. If I simply return a value and if I throw an exception, obviously makes a difference of several orders of magnitude from a performance point of view. And there is definitely projects where this is absolutely uh, intolerable. You cannot wait for an arbitrary amount of time uh, until some exception is properly handled. So the cost of throwing exception may be totally beyond what you can accept. However, there is also other arguments. Exceptions make it harder to reason about functions. If you take a look at some function signature, you definitely do not know whether the function throws or if it does not throw. There's just one exception. If a function is marked as no except, then you have some idea that it does not throw. But everything else potentially does throw. And so it's definitely harder to uh, reason about what does the function do, how does it truly work. Another problem, especially in the embedded domain, is that exceptions do reserve a little memory for themselves. That is actually that they have to do in order to properly work, even in this uh, scenario that you cannot allocate any memory anymore. So, bad uh, memory, uh, the bad alloc exceptions. If you cannot allocate anymore, new would throw bad alloc. And curiously enough, this can happen multiple times. So you need enough memory for several bad alloc exceptions. And of course, this needs to be allocated up front. This is something that is not Enormous, of course, but still is a little overhead that, in some cases, you don't want to pay. And then there's another kind of memory, the binary size. Whenever you use exceptions, the binary size does grow. And unfortunately, this can also be an an untolerable overhead, especially in an embedded domain. This uh, binary growth might actually make the difference between being able to put it on a chip and not. It grows because all exception models, whether you use a so-called frame-based model or a table-based model, have to allocate additional data structures in order to deal with the exceptions. Somewhere needs to be stored which uh, catch handler is dealing with something. Um, So the binary size does grow, and sometimes it does just grow too much. That is a problem, a real problem. This is what the uh, mentioned paper tries to fix. This paper is one of several attempts to um, rework exceptions such that these overheads simply disappear. From a performance point of view and also memory uh, consumption point of view, exceptions should become something that everybody can use. This is actually something that in the mentioned talk by Phil Nash and Simon Brandt, they also took into account and they predict that this mechanism would basically be a perfect, or would get a perfect scale, almost perfect. Of course, this is a prediction, but uh, still from all the points that they use, yeah, and a couple are pretty interesting, like safety, um, reasonability, composability, um, they really give the best mark that they can give, a, the best grade. 
So this is definitely something to look forward to. Yeah. And as Andreas, the other organizer here in the group, uh, basically said in one of his talks, the goal is to make exceptions usable for everyone, in every project, in every situation. And that ultimately is the goal, and that ultimately is now the reason why so many people nowadays talk about exceptions. It is not just to fix things, it is also to give people some advice how to do it. So, we want to make exceptions useful for everyone, technically, and we also want to teach how to work with exceptions properly in order to avoid all kinds of problems. The first point actually has been taken care of to some extent by Inba Levy last week in a talk called Exceptions Under the Spotlight. If you want to talk, uh, see this talk again, um, go to our um, uh, Twitch channel or YouTube channel. Um, there you can uh, watch it again. Alternatively, you can also watch it again uh, on Monday at CPPCon. This talk is now dealing with how to work with exceptions properly. So, how do exceptions work? What's the basic uh, yeah, the basic uh, details of this uh, mechanism? Let's assume a slightly non-trivial uh, code, a function f that does some things and potentially fails under some conditions, a function g that at some point uh, calls f, also has some local variables, a function h, and a main function that starts by calling g, then wants to call h, and finally does catch. Exceptions, first of all, um, involve three keywords that are specifically dealing with this mechanism. Throw, this is where the exception is generated, and try and catch. This is the place where I actually try to deal with an exception. The keyword try actually doesn't do anything. Yeah, this was just introduced by Pionist Twistup in order to make you help reason about this code. Catch, on the other hand, is then truly the place where you deal with an exception. You realize that you do these two keywords, uh, throw and catch primarily, um, the generating generation of an error or the signaling of an error and the uh, handling of an error are very nicely separated. Now there's almost nothing in between. If I do throw an exception in function f, then the first thing that I do is I actually clean up my local variables. So I do not just leave the function, I first of all take care of destroying all my local stack objects. This is called stack unwinding. And this goes on. So I now leave function f, go to function g, which also has a couple of stack variables, which are taken care of also. So also this vector is cleaned up, all the according memory is properly destroyed via the destructor of a vector. Then I go to uh, the call site, this is here, and I do not continue to now call h. There was an exception, so I go on and finally arrive at the, calls, uh, at the catch site. This is the place where I now deal with the exception. I try to do whatever is in my power to um, repair things, perhaps retry things. Um, this is the right place to do it. I do only do stack unwinding, however, because I try and catch at some point. If I omit try and catch, unfortunately, there is no stack unwinding. Both the string s in f and the vector v in g might be lost. Both might actually um, leak their resources, which in this case is just memory. But of course, there could be things that you definitely don't want to lose. So. Stack unwinding is a mechanism that you only get if you probably catch, and so at least you should catch anything, something. And the something is called the catch all handler. Catch dot 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 basically means catch something. I don't care what it really is. I just want to do some kind of cleanup, including the stack unwinding mechanism, and then I'm basically um, done with it. So this does not allow you to do anything specific because you do not even know the type of the exception, but um, you can do some generic uh, cleanup that uh, helps you to recognize that there was some problem. That is the basic uh, mechanism. It's important to realize that destructors are really valuable here, but they're only called if you truly put this in a try-catch block. So at this point, are there any questions so far? Uh, 
Okay. If not, no problem. Then we just continue with. No uh, question from our side. Okay, thank you. Then we just start to dive into how to deal with exceptions properly. And the first big question is when to use exceptions and when not. So, when should you use exceptions? Use the exception mechanism for errors that are expected to occur rarely. We just heard that exceptions may be pretty expensive. So, if an exception is thrown, you pay for this um, with a big um, performance hit. You, do sh you should not do this um, for a lot of things. So, exceptions really report the things that you truly do not expect that happen rarely. Use exceptions for the exceptional cases. The things that cannot be dealt with locally, like OO errors, for instance, a file was not found, although it was ex expected, or you cannot find a key in a map, although it was expected. This may be truly unex uh, unexpected things, exceptional cases, um, that you simply cannot fix locally. And there's no alternative then to report uh, the error upwards. And you probably use it for operators and constructors. Because this is things where you cannot um, return an error code or uh, any kind of other, um, use any kind of other um, error mechanism. So when I say operator, I mean things like addition operators um, like, um, that usually return the result of an addition. And of course, constructors do not have return values on their own. Of course, these two are very good examples for places that cause trouble if you cannot use exceptions. So allow me one remark at this point. If you cannot use exceptions, and if you want to probably deal with failing constructors, I recommend a talk given by Andreas, fixing two-phase initialization. This is just a five-minute lightning talk, but it very nicely explains um, what you can do in order to fix this usual approach of first calling a constructor that does some half work, and then calling an init function later. Yeah, so. Um, Recommended side note for more references. Do not use exceptions, on the other hand, for errors that are expected to occur frequently. In this case, it is probably better to report this in a different way. For instance, don't use it for functions that are expected to fail um, because, well, a lot of things may happen. So as an example, consider, for instance, this toInt function. toInt gets a string and is supposed to extract the integer from the string. Now, this can fail any time. I might have something that simply cannot be turned into an integer. So I expect that the error could be wrong. In this case, I would prefer a different way um, to report an error, uh, and a different way to exceptions. For instance, I could return an optional. So that optional is probably a very convenient choice here. Either you return a null opt, so not some, uh, nothing, or you return the proper integer. That's a very nice way to deal with this. Alternatively, you might use, uh, you might have heard this before, a std expected, which did not make it into C++20, however. Now, so if you have some std expected uh, available, use that, of course, else you might be uh, tempted to use boot, boost outcome, which is um, the, um, the template used to implement standard expected. So this is a kind of function that probably does work best without exceptions. Also, this is making the function easier to comprehend. It directly returns something that uh, you recognize as, well, it could fail to. And the function doesn't pretend that all strings can be converted into an int. And that's probably the right approach here. Then, don't use exceptions if you have to guarantee certain response times even in the error case. As I said in the beginning, if you indeed have to deal with uh, a specific response time, it, an exception might actually um, fail you pretty badly here because it can take a very long time until it is properly handled. This is usually what happens in um, embedded uh, context, one of the primary reasons why exceptions cannot be used. And Please don't use exceptions for things that should never happen in the first place. So for instance, dereferencing null pointers. That's a logic error. That's, that's a programming error that should not be reported by means of an exception, but should be fixed um, 
So this is something that you might do via an assertion. Out of range accesses, use after free or similar examples. Um, this is simply programming bugs. An exception is something that should report something that can happen, but that's not considered a bug. All right, any questions at this point? Um, no further questions so far. All right. Then, let's talk about how to use exceptions. This is best practice. So, the first best practice is how to throw exceptions. Well, please throw them by R value. What do I mean with throw by R value? At some point, for instance, in this function f, I am throwing an ex uh, exception. And I can create an exception, in this case, a runtime error. I give it a message. In the next line, I say throw error. Well, what exactly is thrown? Well, it is not the, uh, the thing that I create at this point. This object, it's always a copy of whatever I create in this context. So this runtime error will be copied. This copy is somewhere where um, the compiler handles it properly. Um, the original is essentially lost. Since it is copied, we should make it as simple as possible for the compiler to, if possible, uh, get rid of this copy. This is why it is suggested to directly return an unnamed object. This may easily trigger the return value optimization or move operations. Uh, in other words, it may be a little more efficient. So. No name, which makes it an R value, throw by R value. I'm throwing the copy of exactly the type that I uh, throw. I now should catch by reference. In the catch clause, essentially you can catch whatever you want to. Yeah, I, sh I even already showed you that it can even catch uh, anything. To some extent, this works like a function parameter. And just like a function parameter, you could catch by value, by reference, even by pointer in some uh, weird cases. Um, so in this example, I would now catch by value. If I catch by value, first of all, this creates another potentially unnecessary copy. And second, this may actually not really catch the real exception type. It might actually slice the thing that I have um, th uh, thrown. So if I throw a runtime error, I'm only copying the exception part of this particular exception. And that is, of course, not really what you would expect. Yeah, you don't want to uh, only copy one part of an object, you want to copy the full object. In this particular case, it is always recommended to catch by reference. In most cases, you want to catch by reference to const, because in most cases you uh, don't want to modify the exception. Alternatively, in some cases, you can also actually uh, catch by reference to non-const. This allows you to modify the exception, for instance, to add more information to the exception, um, but it's probably not what is used most often. The canonical um, catch is catch by reference. Then what should I throw? Well, you should actually throw something that is based on the exception standard exception hierarchy. Standard exception is the base class of a huge number of exception that already exists in the standard library. Now this slide is pretty full in order just to show there is a lot already. So exception is a base class for logic errors, and that's quite a number, runtime errors, there's even more of these, and a lot of other things that are pretty specific, like the bad cast that I already mentioned, um, Things like bad alloc. No, so I, I mentioned bad alloc. I'm sorry. Um, there's a lot of uh, things already available. If you have something that does not fit into this particular hierarchy, then still base it on this hierarchy. In the most simple case, derive from standard exception. In perhaps a more specific case, use logic error or runtime error, perhaps, or any of the others that just does fit your case. This makes it simpler to handle exceptions um, because. If everything is based on std exception, then it's definitely much easier to um, catch things uh, by a specific type. And last but not least, do not use any kind of exception specification. So what do we mean with that? As already mentioned, 
a regular function does not really uh, tell you what it throws or if it throws at all. For the reason, once upon a time, you had the option to also use the so-called exception specification. You could use or you could, could explicitly tell somebody what you would throw. Since this did not really work as people expected, and since this usually did just create a huge overhead in uh, code maintenance, this feature was deprecated in C++11. Even something that was actually pretty reasonable, I, do, uh, I promise that you would not throw anything. This is the one exception specification that you should use today. If you have a function that does not throw anything, and it wholly uh, and swears that it will not throw anything, then um, use no except. That is perfectly suited, but do not throw anything else. So this function does not promise anything, so it could throw anything, and this function promises not to throw anything. That's the two possible cases. There's unfortunately nothing in between. Okay, any questions about these basic mechanisms? There are two questions. The All first right. question is, is there a specific reason why the compiler doesn't perform named return value optimization, NRVO? In this case, uh, it's on slide 40, I think. Okay. That's, mm -hmm. So, I did not say that... Um, oh, one before, maybe? Uh, one before, yeah. right. Um, mm -hmm. There is no... I, I did not say that the compiler doesn't do it. NRVO is definitely an option. But usually there is no reason to first create a named object and then return it. It usually is simpler and almost always possible to return right away. I didn't say that the other thing is bad. I just said that this is the canonical and preferred way. And so um, if you have nothing special, do it this way. If, of course, you need to create something, then build it up. It might also work um, just fine. OK, I hope this answers the question. Seems uh, reasonable to me. Um, why should we care about an extra copy in throwing or catching an exception when it happens only in the failure path that is super slow anyway? That's a fair question, I have to admit. Um, I, I probably do not have a particularly good answer here. You're right, the throw case is super expensive and probably don't really worry about an additional copy. Um, still, I would just go with the canonical way because this is also what people just realize or read. Um, it's the canonical form. Yeah, so um, probably I do not care about an additional copy. Um, the only special case I cannot think of is indeed a bad alloc. Uh, if you do an additional copy and a string, a string that is uh, used to uh, carry a message has also delicate, well, Let's don't um, do the additional copy if you don't really need it. But indeed, this is the only um, special case I can think of. Um, and if you are out of memory, you probably have much, much uh, bigger problems anyway. Okay. Um, there's one more. All right. Should a logic error better be checked with an assert instead of an exception? There is now the tendency to argue that a logic error is a programming error and should be uh, uh, dealt with differently. Yes. Um, so if you, for instance, watch talks by, given by Phil Nash, the recent talks, of course, um, then um, you will find that this is exactly the argument that he gives. I would also argue that most uh, logic errors can be handled differently. So buffer overflow, buffer underflow, uh, this is things that you should probably fix and, and deal with differently. Um, I'm not the one who says that all kinds of logic errors are, uh, are bad. It probably depends a little bit on your uh, specific domain. You know, perhaps you have some kind of logic things that cannot be easily fixed. Uh, but generally, I would argue, yes, you're, you're correct. OK, that's it so far. All right, thank you. So now, next part. Let's talk about exception safety. This is something that, um, if you've not heard about this before, is indeed a little special. This has to do with the fact that if an exception is thrown, I want to give promises, guarantees to the, um, the user of my functions. And there is officially three exception safety guarantees. 
that have been introduced by Dave Abrams, well, in around um, 1995, 1996. The first guarantee that they came up with is called the basic exception safety guarantee. If a function throws an exception, then the function promises, if it uses this exception safety guarantee, that all invariants of an object, if it is a member function, are preserved. So an object will remain in a valid state. We do not know exactly which state, but it will definitely be a valid state. That is the promise. And also, no resources are leaked. If an exception is thrown, I will I promise not to leak any kind of resource. That is already a pretty good promise. This gives me um, the confidence that my code is still okay. My current state is um, is is in a valid um, state. But this is not a guarantee that really promises me that nothing happens. That is the next step. The next higher guarantee that is uh, officially called the strong exception safety guarantee. It promises the same two things that the basic exception guarantee promises, but additionally, it promises that if an exception is thrown, no state is changed. So, in a database semantic, you would call this a transaction, also a commit or rollback. Either everything works and succeeds, or you completely roll back the uh, all that has been done before, and it is as if nothing has happened. It is as if you would not have called the function. That is, of course, a wonderful thing to have. But as we'll see in the next part, this is sometimes pretty expensive to realize. And sometimes, therefore, we just stick to the basic exception safety guarantee because the strong exception safety guarantee may be unreasonably expensive. And there's even one more, something beyond the strong exception safety guarantee, and that is called the no-throw, or sometimes also the no-fail guarantee. This guarantee says that the operation cannot fail. If you call this function, it promises that there is no possibility that any exception is thrown. This, of course, is a wonderful guarantee because this is something you can work with really well, but unfortunately, not many functions are able to do so. It can only be the most simple functions, the most basic functions, because everything else that builds on other things, of course, depends on the exception safety guarantees on the things it builds. This is the three official guarantees. As we know, we'll see in the next proceeding, everything should at least provide the basic exception safety guarantee, which is absolutely reasonable. Of course, I want my states to be preserved in the sense, oh, sorry, not states, invariants to be preserved. Um, of course, I want to be in a valid state. And of course, I don't want to leak any resources. So this is absolutely a minimum for reasonable programming. Sometimes I might, however, also uh, lean towards a strong exception safety guarantee, which is not a, uh, um, something that you have to do, though. And in a few cases, we'll also see that the no exception safety guarantee uh, works pretty well. So, at least a function should have at least the basic exception safety guarantee. And so, let's take a look at how this actually works. How to write exception safe code. And I'm starting with a promise. A promise given by John Kalb also in a uh, CPPCon talk from 2015. Uh, so, the, it was a three part talk called Exception Safe Code. And the promise is the following. He promises that if you follow the advice that I will also give you now, the code will be easier to read, which basically also means it's easy to understand and maintain, which is actually pretty good. He also promises that code will be easier to write, which of course is a wonderful thing. There is the promise that there is no time penalty in the sense that you do not add extra effort that um, causes our program to become slower. And additionally, there's the promise that the code will be 100% robust with respect to invariants and resources. That definitely sounds very, very um, promising. But it also is a little scary, um, perhaps because it sounds like a very, very difficult thing to do. However, um, 
I also give you the uh, the statement of Dave Abrams, um, who said, exception handling isn't hard, error handling is hard. Exceptions make it easier. And for me, this is indeed a pretty, uh, an absolutely correct statement. A lot of people do not really use exceptions because they feel things are becoming more difficult, more harder to reason about. I feel, I have to admit, that using exceptions makes things indeed a little clearer. And this is not because you know exactly what things are throwing, but because the code itself becomes clearer and easier. And this is exactly what I want to show. And hopefully this is, if there's one takeaway from this talk, the thing that you remember. Even if you do not use exceptions today, even if you're in these 52% of developers that cannot use exceptions, following these guidelines will actually make your code cleaner and easier to handle. And automatically, perhaps for, for the future, when exceptions suddenly become something that it could use, um, you might have code that already can work with them very nicely. So let's take a look at how to write exception safe code. An example I have is a class called widget. So the name itself does not suggest a lot, but this widget, first of all, has an integer i, which in the default case is zero. It has a string s, which in default case is set to default, and it has a pointer called pr. This pointer actually may be null. So it is not guaranteed to always be um, a pointer to some resource, which is again some class, um, but actually it is allowed to be null um, in, in the semantics of this widget. The first function that we add is a copy constructor. That one is actually pretty straightforward, not a lot to think about. In the copy constructor, we first of all copy the int, we copy the string, and additionally we create a new resource. Semantically, I do not want to copy the pointer. Oh, this could be actually a big problem if indeed we just delete something in the destructor of widget. Because after all, then two objects might delete the same resource, which must not happen. So semantically, a widget should always create a real a deep copy of the resource. And this is what I'm doing um, by creating new resource and by calling the copy constructor of this resource. Um, so I create a new resource as a copy of the other one, and I remember the given pointer. So that's the copy constructor. Our endeavor is now to implement the copy assignment operator. And of course, we want to implement it as straightforward as possible, as easy as possible, as correct as possible. Uh, and so I get started by, well, doing the most obvious thing, um, returning this. Okay, I admit this is what I usually forget. So this is a um, pretty first step. So the canonical return value for a copy assignment operator. Now, the first thing I probably do is I copy the int. Okay, that's easy to do. It is just an integer after all. The second thing I do is I copy the string, which is just as simple. Of course, it's a little more um, complex under the hood, but it's still easy to do. And then I, well, basically again, copy the resource. Again, I don't copy the pointer, I create a new resource. Now, if I think about this, um, this is probably not the perfect way to do it because, yeah, of course, I said it before, PR may be a null pointer. So this widget may actually currently have a null pointer and I'm trying to access this null pointer. If it is a null pointer, I would, uh, immediately um, raise the segmentation fault, this must not happen. So I should better check this before. So if it is not a null pointer, then and only then I create a new resource. Still, it's not okay, I think. We're missing something. Now, of course, if I create a new resource and assign something to this pointer, then I'm actually losing the old resource. It's a copy assignment operator. I'm changing an existing object, which already might have a resource. So I definitely have to take care of this first. So I delete the old resource first, and then potentially I create a new um, resource, a new. 
It looks pretty okay at this point, but I think we're still missing something. Yeah, of course. What if I delete my uh, my pointer and then the if is actually evaluating to false? Delete does only delete the memory source. It does not reset a pointer to null, which means in the case that now the if is false, I have a dangling pointer, which is an invalid state. My object would definitely not work properly anymore. And so I have to take care of the state also. Else I set the pointer to null pointer. Whew. So it's more difficult than anticipated. And well, there is now still something missing, a special case, self-assignment. If I truly assign to myself, then at the point I was, I first of all delete my own resource. I, tr uh, I actually find my own pointer still to be an old pointer. And I would try, try to uh, copy from my old dangling pointer, which again doesn't work. So I protect myself against the special case. I add a statement which is called a protection guilt self assignment. If the address of W is not the same thing, if it's not the same object, I simply don't do anything. I return this. Whew, now we're done and we're pretty proud of ourselves. Unfortunately, from an exception point of view, this code is now not in the category of any of the um, uh, things that I've shown you before. This code is now exception unsafe because of this line here, new resource. Both the new and the resource could actually throw an exception. Since the new, uh, throw, new throwing could be a real big problem, the resource constructor throwing is definitely a very unfortunate situation. Because if it does, I still have the old pointer. Now, I did not reset the old pointer to null pointer. And I'm again left with a dangling pointer. And also, I have halfway copied the object. I've already changed my integer, I've changed my s. And that again would be a very unfortunate situation. So this code is exception unsafe. It looks like this is now a pretty hard thing to fix. But let's analyze first why this code is, um, is a problem from my point of view. It is just approximately 10 lines of code. And still, in these 10 lines of code, I'm dealing with so many different issues. I'm dealing with different kinds of copy operations, integers and strings and pointers, etc. I'm dealing with pointers, null pointers, um, potentially dangling pointers. Um, I'm dealing with resource management. I am newing things, I'm deleting things. I'm really trying to do everything that I can think about in this just in, in these 10 lines of code. Of course, this is really difficult to get right. Of course, it is difficult to consider exceptions too. Well, in this particular case, we can actually fix a problem easily. If we put the else branch before the if, so if we unconditionally set the pointer to null pointer, then actually this function is said to be basic exception safe. That is because if indeed the, um, the construct of resource is thrown an exception, at least I've uh, set my object in a valid state. Yes, both the integer and the strings have changed, but still all my data members are in some valid state. I didn't say that it has to be a specific state, but it's one of these valid states. So invariants are preserved and no resources are leaked. No resources are leaked because the resource that I'm viewing here never came into existence. If the constructor of resource throws an exception, there is no resource. And so I'm actually fine. And believe me that this new here, which of course has already a prior to calling this constructor allocated a little piece of memory, is dealing with freeing this memory also. So the standard promises that if new fails, the memory is, uh, or the constructor then fails, the memory is cleaned up properly afterwards. So no resource leak here. 
That is great. But still, it is hard to reason about this function. It is hard to reason about this function because it still I'm dealing with all of these details that um, I mentioned before. Which means I would like to simplify things. And one of the most important ingredients to easy and exception safe code is four letters that you should definitely remember always. These letters are R-A-I-I. Instead of dealing with pointers manually, what I should do nowadays is to use a class that deals with this pointer automatically, to some extent. The class I'm looking for here is Unix Pointer. If I would use Unix Pointer to resource, and if instead of calling new and delete myself, I would simply use make unique, then a lot of the complexity in this function is already gone. I do not have to delete anything anymore. I don't have to new anything anymore. It just works, which is pretty convenient, of course. Um, so this is definitely a very, very important ingredient. I actually hope that all of you have heard this before. If not, RAI stands for Resource Acquisition is Initialization. And yes, yes, I know this is officially the worst acronym that we have in C++. It simply doesn't make any sense. Yeah, resource acquisition is initialization. If you try to think about this, reason about this, you want to come to a really good conclusion. It's the idea that counts here. Resources are managed by objects, not manually. This is, of course, something that I don't want to go into detail now. There is an excellent talk from last year. It was also part of the Back to Basics track, Rai and the Rule of Zero, given by author Odwaya. I really recommend this talk. Also, as a reminder that this is indeed something that you should use everywhere. Today, actually, we referred to um, basically uh, um, manually managing a pointer is close to programming a bug. Now, because eventually you might miss something. And so today we really look at this as something very suspicious. Yeah? Or to perhaps put it into different words, the words of John Kalb, keep your resources on a short leash do not go leaking wherever they want. So try to um, use Rai as much as possible. And we can actually extend this idea for our function, for a copy assignment operator. This line of code can still fail. The construct of resource that is not just wrapped in this make unique function could still fail and could still throw an exception. We can actually refactor. We can refactor by means of this Rai idea. First of all, I'm copying the int, then I'm copying string. And then I am basically creating a new object. This is something that I also encode somewhere else. And this is exactly the reason why this is on slide two. This is my copy constructor. Exactly the same operations also happen here. Why don't I use them? It's already there. I first of all create a temporary widget inside the copy assignment operator. So this line calls the copy constructor. Now, of course, I'm not done here, but because I'm using some object that would also perfectly clean up after itself, this is now again a Rai based approach. I manage resources, I don't do it manually. Now, I just need to transfer the new resources and all the data that this temporary has into myself. And the easiest way of doing this is to just move the object into this. So I use the move assignment operator from temp to this. That's the so-called temporary move idiom. Um, and essentially, this is a two-line approach. Create a temporary and move to yourself. This, however, only works reasonably if you have a move assignment operator available, that is actually declared as no except. So now I have two things. First of all, the copy assignment operator is suddenly strongly exception safe. Why? Well, if anything bad happens, then this function, uh, this line of code here, actually it doesn't change anything in my state. I create a new object that might allocate a resource, but if something fails up here, well, I did not touch or change the state of this at all. But if this line succeeded, 
then I'm calling something that is now giving me the no throw guarantee. It promises, it swears not to throw an exception. And so nothing can fail here. This is the strong exception safety guarantee because no invariants are leaked, no resources are leaked, uh, invariants are preserved, no resources are leaked. And if anything bad happens, no state is changed. And it's really simple to do. It's just two lines of code. But, of course, um, there is easier and more cheap ways to, uh, to do this. So, the strong exception safety guarantee now re re requires me to always create a copy. This is something that I could also um, get rid of. There is a couple of functions that should never fail. The first function, kind of function that should never fail is destructors. This is actually something that is really important to remember. Destructors are called during stack unwinding. They're called when an exception is already flying. C++ only allows you to have one exception flying at a time. If you throw an exception while another one is flying, or more specifically, if an exception leaves a function, thrown from a function while another one is flying, the terminate function is called. And terminate is a function that will immediately end the process. There's also no, um, no cleanup, uh, stack unwinding called. This would be very unfortunate. So cleanup must be safe. You must be able to rely on cleanup when you deal with exceptions. The second kind of function that should be uh, should give the no exception safety guarantee, or the, the no throw guarantee, is the uh, is in the move operations. There's also a core guideline that uh, makes a suggestion. Core guideline C sixty six make move operations no accept. And note that this is more like an imperative. It's not like a prefer to make them no accept. It basically says do it because it's so valuable. Every move operation can be made no accept. Sometimes uh, it's a little more um, contrived, a little more complex, but indeed you should be able to do this. Most of the move operations are trivially no accept. And this is because there is one other function that actually can be uh, implemented given the no throw guarantee, and that is swap operations. Swapping two objects should, not must, but should also always work without uh, any kind of throw because a swap can be implemented really, really easily. Let me demonstrate this by means of a widget. So I can swap a widget by simply swapping the individual data members. So I create a temporary. I swap the integer from this temporary to myself. I swap the string. I swap the pointer. This is now not a temporary move idiom anymore. This is now called the temporary swap idiom. But it just works as well because these swap operations work. The int, well, swapping to integers cannot fail. And in the third line, swapping to pointers cannot fail. The only operation that may be a little more difficult is swapping the string. And if you look up the string swap operation in uh, Stack Overflow or CPP reference or wherever this is uh, well, your favorite reference, then um, you will find that this is no except two. So all of these operations cannot fail. And so again, still I'm strongly exception safe. Since this might repeat in a couple of places in your class, you probably might want to um, write a swap function yourself. For that reason, we add a non-failing swap operation in our widget. The first thing we do is to say using std swap before we actually swap all our data members. This allows swap to pick the right swap or allows the compiler to pick the right swap. Um, it will pick even the right function for uh, the, the string, It will pick the one from the standard namespace, yeah, which I said here. That's the right way to write a swap function. All of these operations are again no except, and so I can truthfully promise that this function will not fail, that this function is no except. This function, however, is not what users probably call because users usually call a swap function with two arguments. This now is a member function with a single argument. But this function has free access to the private data members. I just need to combine this with another swap function, which I put outside of the class as a free function. This swap function takes two arguments, two widgets with non-const references and simply calls the member. 
So the combination of these two swap functions, something that you find in a lot of standard classes as well, like standard string, standard vector, standard list, and all the other containers, um, this is the way to implement an exception safe, or no throw um, swap operation. If I have this, then of course our copy assignment operator gets a little shorter. I can simply create a copy and then swap this. Now this is um, an alternative to the temporary move medium, which probably just is a little more uh, efficient. All right. The one thing that you should now take away from this is that indeed this code is simpler. Way simpler than the code that I've shown you before. It is almost trivial to look at. There is no ifs. And indeed, the first if in this function, this suddenly becomes more like an optional thing. Because if you think it through, even without this, um, this um, statement, it would work. We could now argue that perhaps it's more efficient in this special case, but it would still work properly. And so indeed, I could implement this function without any kind of if, without any kind of dealing with pointers or dealing with resources. It is pretty straightforward, very easy to read, very easy to maintain. And so this is not just something that you want to do in order to deal with exceptions probably. This is something that you want to do in order to have better, easier code. And so exception safety is indeed something that may be even valuable for you if you um, um, cannot use exceptions today. And you ho hopefully this gives you an idea why I repeated John Kalb's promise in the beginning. The code is easier to read. There's less code and it's probably more straightforward. Of course, if you have all these uh, this, this functionality in place, it's easier to write. I create a copy and I call throw. Uh, I call swap, sorry. Um, there's nothing that I do extra. It's just the same thing that I did before, but I structure it differently. And it's the major secret behind all this exception safety, um, all these discussions, it usually is just a different way to structure things, a different way to package the, the, the functionality. And now in this example, I indeed have a code that is 100% robust thanks to the strong exception safety guarantee. And it was not particularly hard to, to achieve here. So a couple of takeaways. First of all, please remember these four letters. This, I believe, needs to be in the vocabulary of every C++ developer. Rye is the single most important area of the C++ program language. Use it. Then all functions should at least provide the basic exception safety guarantee. If possible and reasonable, perhaps even the strong guarantee. Reasonable, again, means Probably it's more expensive than a basic guarantee. Um, you should probably favor the basic guarantee if it would be unreasonably expensive. And consider the no-throw guarantee, but only provide it if you can guarantee it even for possible future changes. So do not, because right now it is no accept, give this no accept guarantee, give it only to functions where you are absolutely certain that even in the future it will remain no-throw. Because removing this promise is a very difficult thing to do. Yeah, you cannot back down on this particularly strong promise. All right. Then, um, before we have a couple of questions, um, how to deal with failing cleanup functions. I think this is a problem that comes up regularly. Um, what if um, the destructor throws? Because I just said destructors must not throw. But there is functions that actually fail, cleanup functions that fail. For instance, fclose. So fclose is a function that is given a file pointer that is supposed to close the file, but it might actually fail because the file cannot be closed. This function returns an error code that indicates that the file couldn't be closed. If you are in this particular situation, it is definitely a little unfortunate because if you use this idea of RAII, then you would simply use this function in a destructor, but you don't check the error code. And so this information might simply get lost. And this is exactly what you find in the um, uh, off stream, so standard off stream and um, also if stream classes in, in the standard library. If file close fails, 
you will not get any feedback that this happened. However, still do not try to um, circumvent this Rye idea. It is just too valuable. Implement something that deals with this in a constructor in a reasonable way. The destructor must not throw an exception, but of course the destructor can do whatever is necessary. So I can get this error code and react, for instance, by um, logging something or by reporting it in a different way. But don't throw. That would definitely make exception safety very, very difficult because destructors are just so fundamentally important. So in other words, uh, for handling the error case differently, so if you want to deal with um, failing functions in a destructor, um, write your own write class that uses the strategy that is convenient for you or reasonable for you. All right, this was a longer part. Are there any questions at this point? Yes, there, has, there have been a couple of questions. There has been a lively discussion uh, going sure, on at the same time. Yep. I think we will have some people in the after talk chat. Uh, it seems to That's be great. a uh, yep. so interest generating topic. Yeah, um, let's let's agree that we should perhaps pick the two um, questions that fit this this best, and I definitely um, am happy to to answer further questions or discuss things in the after talk chat. Exactly. So I'm not going to go into details on the most of the discussion and the questions. Mm -hmm. I this one is quite standalone. I'll ask it. Um, it talks about. I'm not quite uh, sure. I understand it 100. It talks about uh, invariance uh, and the compiler. Um, so if I understood them wrong, I'm sorry, please come to the after talk chat and uh, clarify this. It asks, um, how does the compiler understand invariants? So, so for example, you have a class that has a private member, for example, a, an integer, and uh, you increment the integer, and then you create a new object. So for example, a bit like an, uh, a vector, and the invariant would be that uh, you count how many objects you have, but the creation of, so you already incremented creating an object, it's like how many objects you have, but you then you create it, that creation might fail. Um, okay. I'm not sure what the question means with how does the compiler understand invariance. Okay, but I think this is something I can still answer um, easily. An invariant is a semantical thing, and the compiler does not understand semantics. An invariant is something that you implement uh, for your particular type. So in my example, in this widget case, an invariant, for instance, is uh, it might be might be that um, a pointer is never null. That would be, for instance, an invariant. Um, this is, however, something that the compiler doesn't check or uh, can guarantee. This is something that you have to guarantee by means of your implementation. Now, my example was a little simpler. It does allow null pointers, but perhaps this this answers the question. Um, you are responsible for your own invariants because only you understand what is an invariant. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks. Um, and then there's one very uh, isolated small question I think you might be able to answer. Uh, uh, why not using in class friend swap function? Also an option. Absolutely. Um, this is a, a so called hidden friend and might actually also have a couple of advantages from a compile time point of view. So perhaps um, if others have not heard this, um, I should perhaps quickly explain it. So I could implement this two argument function that I implement as a friend function also as a friend inside the class. The compiler would consider this function um, when, when it is called, but it would not consider this function for any other kind of object. This is why um, it actually may improve compile time a little bit, um, it is only an option if indeed I have an object of type widget. Um, this is a good thing, absolutely. Um, perhaps it's even better. I, I now consider this as a good advice that I might add f uh, in this talk as well. Thank you. So that's it. Um, okay. We will see you in the after talk chat in a moment. We'll post okay. it in the chat. Yep. And you will also see it on screen, I think. Yes, exactly. I have one more subtopic. Um, Oh, Which it continues. My bad. I'm sorry. <laughs> Which is about refactoring non-exception safe code. You now have seen that there is indeed an advantage to writing code exception safe. And again, it's not about exceptions per se. It is indeed about clean code. It is about um, readable code, maintainable code. Which of course raises the desire to have this kind of code. 
how can I go there? And also, if I now can use exceptions, uh, so let's uh, consider we are um, we have upgraded C++ to the new exception safety mechanism, uh, and now I want to uh, start using exceptions. How should I do that? There's actually a pretty nice way forward. So, you want to deal with a transition from pre-exception safe, exception unsafe legacy code to exception safe code. And there is something called Jean Perrin's iron law of legacy refactoring. And that's quite simple. Existing contracts cannot be broken. That essentially means that if a function never threw an exception before, because it couldn't, it cannot simply start throwing an exception now. You have to approach this problem differently. So, all new code that you write is written to be exception safe. Any new interface that you um, create is free to throw an exception. Um, an old function, however, existing code cannot start to throw now. The code that calls it doesn't expect it, and so this code might not be prepared. So new functions, call a new function, and eventually you will um, deal with the old function by um, replacing it with new calls, rewriting the according calls or call sites, um, and eventually perhaps nobody uses this old function anymore and you can retire it. So um, let me jump over this slide and go to the example directly. Let me just demonstrate it shortly by means of a function that I call load file. Now, I specifically say that um, the details of this function are totally irrelevant. It's about the structure. It's about the general um, way to go there. I also should say that this function um, uses initially um, return codes, but is doing it well. So this is not a bad example. This is just a pre-exception safe example, nothing more. So what do I do here? First of all, I open a file. Or I create a file here and I open it. Then I check whether this worked. Um, if it did work, um, then I get the size of something. If this worked, okay, then I need um, some, some buffer that uh, is called input. So this is here. So um, I set some, some buffer size in here and read the content of the file in, into this uh, byte stream. If anything goes wrong on this, uh, in, on this way, I stop at this point. For instance, if the file has been opened, now I close it at this point. If it ha never has been opened, I don't have to close it. So if you think that this through, this would actually work pretty nicely. It is clean, it is readable, um, but again, it's not about the details. Essentially, I advocated to uh, put things into constructors and destructors. And this is what, of course, now also I also assume. I assume that the file is following the right approach now. And also the other functions, the smaller functions like file get size, file read, they follow this, they cannot throw, they um, um, do not return anymore, they, th uh, yeah, they now return something true and uh, they would throw on error they didn't do before. So this is the big change. The file class is completely changed. Separate. Probably it's a new file class. Now you can start to rewrite this load file function. But you do write another function first, which you should probably also name differently, like load file lowercase with um, uh, underscores. This function is now completely based on this right idea. For instance, it creates a file that is open directly. If this doesn't work, it throws an exception. I create a byte stream directly. If this fails, for some reason, anything here in this line, I throw an exception, file is cleaned up properly, nothing bad happens. I read, if anything bad happens here, both file and byte stream are properly cleaned up, nothing bad happens. And I would perhaps just return the byte stream. That's the new function, the replacement. You should still take care of the old function. The old function still exists because still other functions call it, but you can now from this function call the new one 
just translate. So you just deal with exceptions by means of this catch-all handler. Um, you return true in a good case, you return false in a bad case. All new code now calls the upper function. An old code is slowly but steadily during the uh, standard maintenance updated from the lower function to the upper function. Eventually, the lower function is not needed anymore and can be retired. That is the most reasonable way to move forward and this is uh, probably the only way that works reliably. So, do not make a function that has never thrown an exception. Suddenly, don't make it a th throwing function. That causes trouble and this is exactly what, to, what you want to avoid. So, you can do this in a large code base also. It's never, a, a, it, this code base is never at risk. So small bytes instead of doing everything at once uh, and regular maintenance will um, basically do whatever you need. Now, so once again, the code gets simpler. It's easier to read. It's easier to write. There's no extra time penalty. I st simply structured it differently and it works. So. Hopefully this is a last example that shows that this might be even interesting if you do not throw exceptions. Okay, so much for my talk. Perhaps there's any kind of final questions um, before we can indeed dive into the after talk chat. There have been no further questions. Okay, then I th say thank you very much. Um, I definitely would welcome any kind of feedback on the talk directly in the after talk chat or perhaps you can contact me differently. Um, so if you have suggestions for improvements, font typos, etc. Um, thank you very much.